evening. I am very pleased to welcome everyone to our first Holocaust Living History Workshop of the academic year. It is my great pleasure to announce today's speaker, Dr. Rebecca Erbelding. Due to unforeseen circumstances, our original speaker, Moises Kaufmann, had to pull out of the engagement at short notice. Dr. Erbelding will be introduced today by her partner in conversation, Professor Alan Havis, a professor in the UC San Diego Department of Theater and an award-winning playwright. Before I pass the microphone over to him, so to speak, I would like to thank the library and the Jewish Studies Program for their continued support of the Holocaust Living History Workshop. I also thank Eleanor Roosevelt College and its provost, Professor uh, Ivan or Evan or Ivan, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, sorry, uh, Evans for additional support of today's event. A few words about technical issues. Closed captioning is enabled, so if you would like, please turn that on using the button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit questions using the Q&A button uh, also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, throughout the event, I will keep track of the questions. The chat feature is not enabled. Uh, today's program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube page within the next few weeks. And now it's my pleasure to ask Alan to uh, start talking. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Suzanne, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our featured guest, uh, Rebecca Erbelding, who is a highly respected scholar of American responses to the Holocaust and the author of Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe, published by Doubleday in 2018, which won the National Jewish Book Award for writing based on archival material. She served as a historical advisor and an on-camera expert in the Florentine films, The U.S. and the Holocaust, directed by Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein. As a historian and educator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, she publishes frequently on the War Refugee Board. U.S. immigration policy during the 1930s and the Hokum album, a phot photograph album owned by Carl Hoker, the final adjutant to the commandant of the Auschwitz Birkenau. Her work on the Hoker album has been adapted into a theatrical production. Here there are blueberries written by Moises Kaufman and Amanda Grodnick and developed by the esteemed Teutonic Theater Project, which is the focus of today's public webinar conversation. Rebecca holds a PhD in American history from George Mason University. Welcome, Becky. I'm honored to be here with you and to have the opportunity to ask you many questions on the Blueberries Theater production, which I had the pleasure to see during the La Jolla Playhouse run about a year ago. And it might help our audiences tonight if you could just within maybe two or three minutes, give us a capsule profile of the production and why it's so noteworthy. Sure, um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for allowing me to step into Moises's massive shoes. Um, I hope our conversation, I think our conversation will, will be very interesting to people. Um, so you read a very long resume of mine, most of which is irrelevant to today's conversation. Um, the piece that is relevant is that I have been with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for the past 21 years. And the first few years of my work, um, I was responsible for new archival collections. So material donated by survivors and liberators and their families, um, things they found in attics, things they kept during the war. Um, and in 2006, uh, I received a photograph album that ended up being the final photographs of Auschwitz in operation. The, the infamous concentration camp and killing center where more than 1.1 million people were murdered. Um, I can show you actually a few pages uh, from the album. Um, and my work on this album, the discovery of the album, all of the research that we did, and then what happened after this album went public is the topic of the play, Here There Are Blueberries. Um, if you know anything or if our, our um, viewers know anything about the Tectonic Theater Project, they are a documentary theater company. Um, they tend to do live 
pieces based on historical research and based on interviews, um, most notably the Laramie Project about the murder of Matthew Shepard, which is in the news right now because this is the 20th, 25th anniversary of the discovery of his body in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, and so that's another thing that we're remembering tonight. But um, Moises Kaufman read about this album and read about the work that we had done on the album um, and reached out to me in 2010 to talk about whether um, I thought that this, this story could become a play. And of course, no one ever expects their work or their life to become a play. Um, and so I, I showed him what I will show you now, which is that this is when we received the photograph album in 2006. Uh, this was the first page. And um, we received the album from an anonymous donor. Uh, I know who he is, but he asked for anonymity and he is a character in the play um, expressing his desire for anonymity. And he explained that he had been a counterintelligence officer in Germany right after World War II and that he had found a photograph album um, in a trash can in Frankfurt, Germany. And he had taken it home with him. He was now in his late 80s, didn't know what to do with it and didn't have any family. And would the museum be interested in accepting this album? Um, I was very skeptical because there are actually very few images of Auschwitz in operation. Um, but I was curious. And so I asked him if he would send us the album. And this is the first page um, of the album when we received it. And this is actually what it looked like. This is a scan from the second day of us having the album and started to look through, um, looking for images that you would expect to see of Auschwitz, images of prisoners, images of trains, images of the gas chambers. And that is not what is in this album. And I think that's one of the things that intrigued Moises about it so much. And Amanda, um, as they were thinking about whether this could be a play, is that this is really an album of the SS. This is an album of the command staff at Auschwitz going through their daily lives, ceremonies that they're having, parties that they're throwing. Um, this is Carl Hawker, the, the owner of the album. This is his dog, Favorite, uh, who he's showing off in his album. And here's Christmas 1944, only less than a month before Auschwitz will be evacuated and about 80,000 prisoners sent out on foot in the snow from German-occupied Poland. Um, we realized how special this album was almost immediately um, because we saw this, this page right away. And I had done, um, in uh, my undergraduate career, I had written a paper on Joseph Mengele and our memory of Joseph Mengele, the infamous Nazi doctor. And so I recognized that he is the man second from the left in this album. And I also knew from that research that there were very few actually no photos of Mengele while he was stationed at Auschwitz. And so this album has seven of them. Um, they are the only known photos of Mengele while he was at the camp. And so that's what launched the museum on this track of trying to figure out everything we can about this album and kind of the questions that it asks about human nature. And that I think was the thing that, that really intrigued Moises and Amanda into creating a play that is really about historical research and the unintended consequences, the unforeseen um, things that happened after we discovered that we had this um, kind of amazing photograph album. Great. Um, so Becky, uh, I have a list of, of questions that might help us understand more about the power of the work and the impact uh, to audiences. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Susan Sontag's highly influential 1977 book of essays on photography has a standout quotation, and I quote, to photograph people is to violate them by seeing them as they never see themselves, by having knowledge of them they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed. How would you imagine Susan Sontag's reaction to your production? It's interesting because there are really um, two photograph albums that are referenced in the production. So one is Carl Hucker's album. And this, you know, again, is an album of trophy photos. These are photos that he himself um, selected, that he created, that he um, was proud of. This was his life at Auschwitz. 
Um, and this is what he wanted to remember. And so let me, I can show you uh, some more. Here is an image of him um, with, an, with a number of young women at the camp in July, 1945, or I'm sorry, July, 1944. And so I don't think the Sontag quote is particularly accurate here. Like we know things that he does not know about himself when we look at this image. We know what he is doing, which is of course not present in this album. We know that he is a mass murderer, that the people around him are collaborators and complicit in mass murder. Um, and we also know that he's going to lose, that this is an album of photos a, a trophy album of of someone who lost, um, but this is the life that he wanted to remember. So that is one album. And towards the end of the play, the playwrights reference another album, um, an album of photos that was taken by the SS in the summer, the spring of 1944. Um, and it is it contains some of the most infamous images of Auschwitz in operation. Um, these are the images that you think of when you think of Auschwitz. Um, you think of pictures of people take, uh, coming off trains, and that is, that is what these images are. Um, I'll share my screen again so you can see. So if you're thinking of Auschwitz and you close your eyes, this is probably one of the images you're thinking of. These were photographs that were taken by the SS in the spring of 1944, as I said. Um, these are um, people who were in areas of Europe that had been taken over by Hungary and then um, occupied by Nazi Germany in the spring of 44. And the there are about 437,000 Hungarian Jews who were sent to Auschwitz in a span of about 55 days. The majority of them are killed upon arrival. And in late May 1944, the SS takes a series of photos that they put into an album of the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz of, 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 of several train loads of these Hungarian Jews. Um, we know about this album because it was discovered almost immediately after the war by a woman who uh, herself was a, a concentration camp prisoner, newly liberated, who recognized um, her community in this album. This was her community's arrival at Auschwitz. She herself is depicted in this album. Um, and she discovered it 500 miles from Auschwitz in an, in an um, SS barrack as she was recovering from typhus. And she immediately recognized, this is a picture of her two younger brothers. And so about three quarters of the way into the play Here There Are Blueberries, which is all about kind of unpacking Carl Hucker's album, the people who are depicted therein, the descendants of the people who are depicted in the album kind of grappling with seeing their loved ones um, in these photographs of Nazis at play. And then it switches to, let's now look at the reality of Auschwitz, the reality that, that is absent from Carl Hucker's album. And so for the Sontag quote, these are the people who are being violated. These are the people who are staring at the camera. Um, you know, Zelig here is staring at the camera and he probably knows at this point that this is, these are some of the last moments of his life, that this is an SS photographer violating him and taking his picture um, for SS purposes. Uh, I don't think Sontag is thinking about Carl Hucker. Um, we are not, he is not violating anything by by showing his joy of being at Auschwitz. Um, but I think it is important to remember, and the, and the playwrights think so too, that these are the people who have done, the people who are in Carl Hucker's album are the people who did this. And you cannot look at one without looking at the other, if that makes sense. The next question, and this might, be helpful for people who just are tuning in on the webinar to repeat 17 years ago, a retired American counterintelligence officer in Virginia offered the museum the concentration camp album he had found in a trash bin in Germany at the end of World War II. Becky, what thoughts ran through your mind that day and the weeks which followed? How skeptical were you about what was being presented? And 
as a follow-up, how did the stage play capture those thoughts and feelings? So my job was to answer phone calls and and read letters and receive, you know, this is the mid 2000s. We're, so we're receiving emails, not as many um, and not as frequently, but this was my job. And I was at that point, 25 years old, uh, had been working in the archives for about four years. And when I saw the letter that the Lieutenant Colonel sent to us, um, I figured he was wrong. Um, he said that he had an album that were that was of photographs taken in Auschwitz. And I knew first that, that the American army did not liberate Auschwitz and that many people who are looking at a picture of a concentration camp think the word Auschwitz, even when it's Buchenwald or Dachau or one of the camps that Americans did liberate. Um, and that there are very frequently liberation photos of those camps kind of floating around American homes or in attics because it was very typical for American soldiers to go in and photograph the aftermath of liberation. It was actually encouraged by the American liber um, by the American military that they do so, so that the American people would, would believe um, what was happening in, in Europe. And so that was the part that I think I was skeptical about. Once the album arrived, I was not skeptical that it was true. Um, this is not the sort of material that is um, forged in any way. And everything that we found lined up with uh, every kind of historical record, every archival record that we threw it at the album, um, you know, it, it all tracked uh, to be true. And everything that our conservator colleagues were looking at, um, you know, the album was a typical kind of album. The photography was typical of the time. Um, we didn't really have any doubt as to the veracity of the actual album and the photographs themselves. So I think a lot of what they capture at the beginning of the play of kind of the cacophony of requests that are coming in and people making offers, um, that is absolutely true. The museum still collects um, or still receives um, a, a new collection really every calendar day, about 400 new collections a year. And that can range from one photograph to the personal papers of a major figure. And so that is all accurate. And I think some of the initial shock that we had of seeing this and then the debate over what to do about it, um, you know, we're, we're a memorial museum and what is the role of a, a clearly a perpetrator artifact in a memorial museum um, was something that we really thought long and hard about and about how to present it to our audiences um, and how to make sure that people understood that that what is in Hucker's album is both real and not real. It is real to his experiences, but he is very deliberately creating this album to only remember certain parts of his experiences. Thank you. When I saw the La Jolla Playhouse production, I heard audience members, when they left the theater, talk about the German female workers as being monsters of another category. Can you speak to that idea if you discern that there is truth to that remark? Yeah, let me um, let me actually see if I can, while I'm talking, pull up some images of the women. Yeah, this was this was something that was kind of surprising to me because um, we did about nine months of research on the album, um, trying to figure out who is depicted in it, what events are depicted in it, what is actually happening in this album, before we went public with having it, um, and before we made the images available uh, to kind of the wider community. And these images were not really striking to me, but they, they seem to be striking to a lot of people. Um, there's a series of images of the SS Helferinnen. Uh, the Helferinnen were young women. Um, they tended to be between the ages of 17 and 22. Um, many of them had been longtime members of the BDM, which is the Bund Deutscher Mädel, um, the, the kind of female version of the Hitler Youth. And at the National Archives, at the US National Archives, um, not far from me here, uh, just outside of Washington, DC, uh, there are copies of captured German war records. 
And among those German war records were the SS files, which included the applications of these women to go to Auschwitz. So we had their names and we could go in and we could find basically their job applications. And it included handwritten essays in which they explained what, that they wanted to serve the Fuhrer, they wanted to serve the fatherland, they wanted to serve Hitler, um, and that they felt the best way that they could do that was to go to Auschwitz and work there, um, which says a lot about kind of what was known in Germany and what was known throughout this system. And so the album includes the series of photographs from July 22nd, 1944, of Carl Hucker, uh, the owner of the album and the adjutant to the commandant, so basically the chief of staff to the commandant of Auschwitz. This is his personal photograph album. And he has multiple pages of himself escorting these women um, to a resort that was actually officially part of the concentration camp. Um, it was a resort about 17 miles from the gas chambers at a place called Sola Huta, um, or Hut on the Sola River in in. Uh, what was then German-occupied Poland. And you can see Hucker here on the left side of the screen, um, potentially flirting with one of the women. You can see his wedding ring um, there. Uh, Germans wore their wedding rings on the, on the right hand. And they have posed photos here of all of the women in, the uni in their uniforms, but then this page is entitled, Rain Comes from a Clear Sky. And you see them kind of giggling and then running towards the camera to get out of the rain and into the lodge. Um, later in the day, the sun has come out. This album of pages, or this page of images, was, I think, the one that really captured people's attention the most, and it became the namesake of the play. This is Here Give Dis Blaubeer and Here Their Blueberries, and it's a series of staged images of Carl Hucker handing out bowls of blueberries to these young women who are now on the deck of the lodge, and they um, are eating the blueberries. And then they are posing with their bowls upside down to show that they have no more blue blueberries. And the woman um, fifth from the left, we believe her name is Ruth Astrosini, and she is pretending to cry that she is out of blueberries. Um, at this point, Ruth Astrosini is 19 years old. Um, she will become later a guard at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, and she'll be arrested by the British when the British liberate the camp uh, in April 1945. But here she is 17 miles from the gas chamber. Um, and this is the same day that 200 miles away, the Soviets are liberating the Maidanic camp. And so these young women were in charge of the telegraph and telegram operations um, and the radio operations between Auschwitz and Berlin and Auschwitz and the other camps. And so we know that they may not have ever murdered anyone with their own hands but they did know what was happening at Auschwitz. They were responsible for reporting the arrivals of trains, um, how many people were selected for work and how many people were selected to be gassed. And that after the war, with the exception of Ruth Astrosini, who became a camp guard, um, many of these women never left this, this telegraph job, this really glorified, glorified clerkship, um, and they got married and they lived their lives and no one ever came for them. And so I think this idea of, of being monsters of another kind, I, I want to push back on it a little bit because I think one of the things that the album shows is that these are human beings and that's something that we really have to grapple with. Um, that when we call someone a monster, we are dismissing them from humanity. And I think one of the things that, that our work um, teaches us is that unfortunately these people are human beings um, and that we need to grapple with what human beings are capable of uh, and the, the evil that human beings can perpetrate in the violence, but also that they are complicit in what is happening. Um, they did have the option to say no, they did have the option of not participating and that um, they did not take that option. In fact, they they sought this position. And that's something I think we need to grapple with too, that young women are also capable of, of all of this. Yeah, I, I, maybe to qualify the word monster, it, the lack of compassion and to have employment and looking at like they're at a resort, the, the disconnect, the, the humanity or the inhumanity, um, it's, it's easy to then cross the line and, and call people monsters. Um, my next question, uh, 
which is really painful to ask is why are there Holocaust deniers and why do they have such a prominent platform around the world? For example, England's David Irving, who created a lot of havoc in the late 70s and early 80s, and now he's 85. You know, why is there this platform? I mean, it, it, it sounds like a hard question. It's actually very easy. This is anti-Semitism. Holocaust denial is anti-Semitism. Um, pure and simple. The the Holocaust is the most well documented crime in history. Um, anti semite or Holocaust deniers do not grapple with the reality of the documentation, the vast vast documentation of the Holocaust, and they are doing it out of hate. And Holocaust denial still exists because people unfortunately hate Jews, um, and that that hatred is an easy way to explain. Um, it, it's a conspiracy theory, and people are unfortunately incredibly susceptible to conspiracy theories. And so this is a conspiracy theory born of hate. Uh, since here there are blueberries is being seen by audiences in many cities, uh, happily that it's getting productions for a political play and plays don't do well when they're political or box office. Uh, it's it's at a time during, as you say, you know, there's a rise of anti-Semitism that might be part of the the denial of 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 the Holocaust as history. What could you say about the timing of this production uh, and revisiting the Holocaust, where we are nationally and, and around the world? I think this is a different kind of Holocaust play. I think. Um, many of the other plays that you see about the Holocaust um, tend to be from the, the perspective of the victims, and rightfully so, like a lot of them are memorial plays. This is a different kind. This is about perpetrators. Um, this is about what human beings can do to each other. And I think it it is a really relevant play. Um, I think it's relevant now, but I think it would have been relevant 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I think these questions that the play asks are evergreen. And some of it is how, how can people hate in this way? But it is also about the slippery slope that leads people to a place like Auschwitz. And so some people, of course, are true believers. Some of the SS are true believers, were bought into Nazi ideology even before Hitler was appointed chancellor in 1933. But there are also people like Karl Hucker who, you know, lost his father in World War One, was the youngest of, I think, six children, grew up basically in poverty, was a bank clerk when the Nazis took power, and then now is the chief of staff of the commandant of the camp. You know, he is seizing these opportunities as they are coming. And, and we don't know if he's a true believer. I'm, I'm sure that he believed a lot of the Nazi ideology, but he's also an opportunist. And a lot of them are opportunists. And I think that is the slippery slope that that is incredibly relevant to us today is what are we willing to overlook for our own benefit? You know, there are plenty of people who are complicit in the Holocaust or become collaborators because they seize an opportunity that is presented to them to get a better job, um, to advance their own social status or career or to get money, things that are actually fairly understandable to us today, but they mean that slowly, 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 your own morals start to degrade. You start to overlook or excuse yourself for um, the decisions that you're making because you're thinking, well, you know, if it wasn't me, it would be somebody else, or, you know, at least I'll do a good job at this. And no, <laughs> we need to reject those things from the beginning. Um, it is a slippery slope because we fall down it. And there are very human, unfortunately, very human instincts that brought a lot of these people to this place and made them able to commit these crimes. And I think that is something that is an evergreen question, that is something that we need to grapple with and that we need to have conversations about um, because there are plenty of good people who do monstrous things and think of themselves as good people. Yeah, it's very paradoxical. Um, 
I believe in the, the Washington Post review of the play, the critic asked the, asked the question, should there be a place in the US Holocaust Museum's collection for depictions of mass murderers that portrayed them as ordinary humans? How do you respond to that? Yeah, um, Peter Marks, the, the Washington Post theater critic, and I have, have gone back and forth on email a few times um, since then. I think he's a little fascinated about getting to talk to someone who is a character in a play. Um, and I am fascinated with what it's like to be a theater critic. Um, we had a lot of discussion about, especially in 2006, um, about what it would be like for the museum, a, a place that is a memorial, as I said, um, to, to do something about perpetrators um, and show this album that has no victims in it, has no prisoners depicted in it, and the thing that I think we were most afraid of is this actually could be a tool used by Holocaust deniers. You know, Holocaust deniers could look at this album, could look at people having parties, to look at, you know, Carl Hucker playing with his dog and lighting a Christmas tree and say like, look, Auschwitz could not have been that bad. And so we were very deliberate um, in the way that we talked about the album, in the way that we showed the album, to show it with the Lily Jacob album, the album of images of Hungarian Jews arriving and being sorted and waiting outside the gas chamber. Um, because those are the two, those are both happening at Auschwitz at the same time. The people in Karl Hucker's album are directly responsible for what is happening to the Hungarian Jews who are coming off those trains. Um, and you cannot divorce one from the other. And so I think that is where we landed. I think that was why it was important for the museum to show this album and to think about this album and to ask people to grapple with this album with us because six million Jews didn't murder themselves. I My, my character says that in the play because I say that in real life. Um, six million Jews did not murder themselves. And so we, by studying you know, the pre-war life of Jews, um, who were murdered, we are honoring them, we are remembering them in the richness and fullness of their lives, but we are not explaining how they were murdered. To explain how a society came to murder its own people, to take over land in order to murder the people who lived there, we have to look at the perpetrators. And it's hard, and it's uncomfortable, and it raises a lot of really awful questions but I think this is how we work towards a world without genocide is we have to study the perpetrators who did it. Thank you for being so candid about that. Um, Becky, on play structure and dramatic aesthetics, is Blueberry's, forgive the expression, a TED Talk theatrical, a Ken Burns documentary on stage or something akin to Bertolt Brecht's learning plays, the Lehrstruck, how do you describe the structure of it? I've heard it been described, I've not heard it been described as a, a Brechtian uh, thing, but I have heard it described as both a TED Talk and as a Ken Burns um, film. And and if you listened to my bio closely, like I, I worked with Ken and Lynn and Sarah on the US and the Holocaust film. So I understand very closely how they work. Um, Moises and Amanda, when they were putting together the show, the play, um, tried for as much verisimilitude as possible and really tried to echo some of the deep research that we were doing in looking at albums. Um, this is an image of the museum's old conservation lab, uh, a place in the basement of the museum called B69. That was the name of the room. And this is what it looks like on stage. And so you can see you have the tables, you have the overhead lights, um, you have the staff members around. And so um, it, it was very strange to me to see kind of the curtains part at one point and then see what what is kind of a dream like sense of my own old office space <laughs> um, through through the lens of an artist and what that looked like. And a lot of the things that they are showing, um, this is an image, again, um, the character of, of me, uh, the Rebecca character is on the right. Um, on the left is a character of my colleague, Judy, who is the head of our photo reference collection. 
and in the middle is um, the descendant of one of the people who is depicted in the album. And what you see as you go through is, is they are trying very hard to recreate the world of an archive. And as we started examining photos in the play, um, I'm not sure which, yeah, you can see this here. So this is one of the images in which the man, um, the descendant, his uh, grandfather is depicted in this image. And, and what they do in the play is they kind of highlight people they bring it forward, they bring things back. And so the images actually become part of the play um, in a way that I think is very reminiscent to a uh, documentary film. And the way that we as characters in the play explain what is happening is very reminiscent to a TED talk. You know, we are addressing the audience. We are saying, this is how we figured this out. And this is how we did this. And this is what you're seeing here. And these are some of the conversations that we are having. And so it is very kind of explanatory um, with, with these kind of very artistic ways of showing the images. And I, and I will say that, you know, I studied these images for years, um, very closely for nine months. And then again, over, over the period of years and seeing it through Moises and Amanda's eyes, I noticed things that I hadn't noticed before. They were able to, they spent so much time looking at these images too, that some of the detail that they brought out were things that I had missed in my study of these images. And so part of that is I think they're visual in a different way as artists than, than I am, who's very um, historical minded as, as you might say. I have to note that having seen it at, at the La Jolla Playhouse, the scale of the photographs, the, um, the technical proficiency of the, uh, lighting design and the projectionists and all of that, that uh, it was overwhelming to see. I mean, it's one thing to see these photographs on a computer, but when you see it fill an entire theater stage, the wall dwarfing the size of your doppelganger, the, you know, the Rebecca on the stage, uh, it has, it's much more pungent. And, and in some ways it's frightening because it's all real, but it's, it's larger than life. Yeah, uh, the tech, the technical crew of this show, Molly, David, everybody, they're incredible. Yeah, it's. I mean, the design is brilliant, and it's. It helps, you know, deliver the, the payload of the the content of the of the play. Uh, Becky, as a historian, how do you? I I know you've answered this partially with the other questions, but how do you process everything about the Blueberries project? Was it personally painful? How did you handle the paradoxes of the narrative? What were the politics of getting this all the way to the theater? So what's funny is, um, you know, we we went public with having the album in 2007. Um, there was a, a whole flood of uh, press about it, um, both nationally and internationally. There was a National Geographic documentary and there was a New Yorker feature about the album and about our research into it. Um, and then it kind of died down and I was going about my life and, and um, you know, taking in more collections. And then three years later, I, I got via Facebook Messenger, um, a message from Moises Kaufman. And I had done theater in college. And so I, I knew who Moises was. And he said, I'm going to be um, in DC. There's a group nearby who's doing the Laramie Project. And so I'm coming down. And I'm really curious about this photo album. Can I see it? Can I meet you? And I mean, free meeting with Moises Kaufman. That's pretty cool. And so I said, yes. And um, he came down and I think he probably assumed he would stay for half an hour and he stayed for probably close to three because I kept turning pages and then showing him and, and explaining how we how we figured out all of these things. And what would happen is, I mean, you note, that it is 13 years between now and 2010 when I heard from Moises for the first time. And so he would, it would be very intense for a little while and they would interview me and they would do transcripts over a couple of days and then they would go away for sometimes years at a time because Moises was working on something else because he was grappling with something having to do with the play that he couldn't quite figure out. And then he would come back um, and and then go away again. And so it was very stop and start. And I, 
you know, every time would involve my colleagues at the museum and say, you know, Moises is back. Is it still okay that I'm talking to him? Um, and, and everyone was like, sure, yeah, go ahead. Because I don't think anybody ever expected that there would actually be a play. Um, and so I think that was the biggest surprise is, is, oh no, this is a, this is real. And, um, so I had a lot of time to kind of get used to the idea though. I don't think you ever quite get used to seeing it particularly for the first time. Um, but I have been fascinated to watch and, and they've been really gracious in allowing me to, you know, sit in when I am available to sit in. And I, um, I think the actors are kind of fascinated by getting to ask questions of the person that they're playing or the person who kind of lived through what they're depicting. And so when it was in DC uh, this past spring, um, I was able to go to a rehearsal just for a little bit. And Elizabeth Stallman, who does a fantastic job playing the stage Rebecca, um, was discussing with Moises the motivation of the character at one point. And then finally they realized I was sitting over there and they turned and asked me what my motivation was and, and did I know this piece of information at that moment? And I was able to say like, I knew this part, but not this part yet. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a very interesting um, dynamic and relationship between us that I hope has been valuable to them and has been absolutely fascinating for me to kind of watch and be part of. Maybe as a follow-up, is there any moment on stage when you see your avatar and you think i'm not exactly sure if that's a real moment or i i would have been a little different in that moment there's a moment in the play um where the two characters of the mu there are three characters of the museum staff who are named um me judy cohen who is the head of our photo reference um, at the time, and Sarah Bloomfield, who is who was then and is still the director of the museum. And there's one scene where Judy asks me if I'm doing okay, and I kind of am trying to calm myself at that moment. Um, those moments happened, less so with this album, I think. Um, th there are pieces of my work that haunt me very much. Um, I think it's very hard to work in the realm of the Holocaust and not have things that haunt you and stories that um, are still quite upsetting and, and you have to kind of take a walk afterwards. This album was not that for me because by the time, even at 25, by the time I received the album, I had seen some things. And so the album was really more of a way of me to process exposing the people who did it. Like I wanted to know their names and I wanted to make sure everybody knew who they were. Um, so this was not one of the one of the moments in which my emotions were kind of taking over. Um, and I also think there's a there's a scene in which the museum staff is really debating um, what to do with the album. And a lot of the this was a scene that I think might not have even been in La Jolla, but it it came into the DC production. And I, I have the best colleagues in the world. Like my colleagues are so smart and they're so dedicated. And a lot of the, the text of that scene is based on people playing devil's advocate. Um, people saying like, what would you say if people said, there's no place for this album here? What would you say if people said, this will hurt survivors if you show this album here? And I think some people have interpreted that scene as um, kind of me being the triumphant victor in this debate over what to do with the album. And I don't think that's necessarily fair to my colleagues. Um, I think they were right to, and we were right to just continually have that conversation. Um, and I think the way it's depicted in the play can can kind of maybe give the impression that like I was determined and I followed through and um, I am not the protagonist of the play. The museum should be the protagonist of the play. And, and you know, 
we are the ones who put this together, not me. I, I have maybe one quick, quick question, and I, I, I'm really- I'll try to give a quick answer, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for many years, people complain that there is the trivialization of the Holocaust or the metaphor of the Holocaust or the amount of times people will mention Anne Frank, or we've had politicians do that recently in the last couple of months. What is your reaction to that statement about the trivialization of the Holocaust? I mean, I think the, the, the Holocaust can be trivialized. Um, sure, people use it to score political points all the time. Um, and I think they're wrong to do so no matter how, what side of the aisle you're on. Um, the Holocaust is something, it, it, it was millions of people being murdered. That is not something that you should be using to score a contemporary political point. Um, and so there are legitimate comparisons. There are legitimate things that you can do and say, but they have to be seated deeply within the history. Um, and you have to understand and, and make clear the differences in context in which all of these things are happening. Great, Becky, thank you so much. I, I'm getting yeah, I'm getting a signal that we're supposed to go to general Q&A, but it's, 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 it's been an honor to meet you this way and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, uh, we have some uh, interesting questions. The first one, did the people in the photographs ever evince regret about their actions? What do you know about that? In the photographs, um, if they did, it was when they were imprisoned by the allies and awaiting their fate. And so I don't think that any of them did in any way that is actually meaningful. Um, Carl Hooker never expressed regret. Um, he was tried multiple times. Um, Rudolf Hurst wrote his memoirs, didn't really re express regret, but wrote his memoirs, um, which are chilling. Um, and a, a number of them kind of gave the uh, idea that they were just following orders. And unfortunately, a number of them were never tried. Um, they were never caught, they were never tried. Joseph Mengele being, of course, the most notorious of them um never never being captured yeah i do know that hooker he was at the the large uh, auschwitz trial in frankfurt and uh, he denied everything right yes he said I he was on the ramp he only did correspondence um unfortunately like it, it's very clear it would be interesting um if this album had been available during that trial so that was uh, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial was in the early 1960s mm -hmm. at Hucker was kind of the highest up being tried. Uh, the commandant, Richard Bayer, the final commandant of Auschwitz was supposed to be tried, but died of a heart attack before the trial began. And so Hucker was the kind of highest, but wasn't really the focus of the trial. Um, there were other people who kind of stole the stole the spotlight from him. But when it came to his kind of statement at the end he said no one no one was ever killed because of him and we know now from from other testimony that um you know in in the summer of 1944 he's taking a group of nazi doctors around a tour and takes them to witness a gassing and um it, it's pretty clear that he had been on the ramp at various moments um either participating in or at least witnessing the the selection of prisoners and he is absolutely a very important cog in making Auschwitz run um, and making Auschwitz run as, quote unquote, successfully as it did. It doesn't happen without him. Um, he had also been at the Maidanic camp where he was responsible for the purchase of Zyklon B, which was the, the lethal um, gas pellets that were used in the gas chambers there. Right, and uh, as I recall, the other album, that's the Lily Jacob album, right? That was used at the Frankfurt trial. It was, Lily Jacob. Yeah, she brought it, uh-huh, yeah. Yep. Uh, second question, can you talk about the Sobibor perpetrator album discovered two years ago and other efforts to locate uh, similar primary documentation that might still be out there? 
Yes, this was this is an absolutely fascinating album. Um, you can learn more about it on the Holocaust Museum's website. Um, this is an album that was also owned by um, a major SS officer at the Sobibor Killing Center. So Sobibor is, is different from Auschwitz in that it was a killing center. Auschwitz was a killing center and concentration camp, um, which means that there is a selection at Auschwitz and some prisoners are taken to the concentration camp part um, where they are forced to labor for the Nazis and some are taken to the gas chambers at Bear Canal where they're killed on killed basically upon arrival or at some point during their imprisonment at Auschwitz when the SS decide that they're no longer capable of work. Sobobor, on the other hand, is, is strictly a killing center. There's barely a selection. The vast majority of people, no matter their age or their ability to work, are sent to the gas chambers within hours of arrival. And so this album... Um, really gives us the visual picture of Sobibor, which was a place for which there were no photographs before this, and only a handful of survivors. There are only about 50 prisoners who survived Sobibor to the end of the war. Um, there was an uprising at Sobibor. There's a, there's a famous movie about the uprising at Sobibor, and of the prisoners who escape, about 50 of them survive, and some of them give testimony, and that testimony um, is corroborated by the photographs that we now have. Um, you know, one of the things that was always striking about the testimony of survivors of Sobobor is they'll talk about the geese, that there was a flock of geese who lived in this killing center, and the SS would kind of rile up the geese to drown out the sounds that were coming from the, the killing facilities. And it was always like a very strange thing, I think, but the survivors were very consistent in it. And in this album, you see the flock of geese really fascinating. Um, I think there will be a lot more material coming out of Germany and coming out of areas that in which there were Nazi collaborators in the coming years, in part because we are no longer at the perpetrator generation, and we are starting to become not at the children of perpetrator generation, but at the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren who have gotten a lot more Holocaust education over the course of their lives, and have a sense that that what their family has potentially in the attic is really important. And so I think and I hope we will continue to learn um, more about the people who did this and why. Um, again, in the hopes of figuring out what how we can stop this from happening again. Uh, the next question, I'll combine it, it's actually two questions. Uh, somebody is wondering if there's an upcoming production of the play. Uh, and somebody else is wondering, is there um, an online production or is there an online version that has been archived somewhere? So as far as I know, there's no online version. Um, the play debuted at La Jolla Playhouse last summer. Um, and then this past spring, it was at the DC, DC Shakespeare Theater Company. Um, it will make its New York debut next spring at the New York Theater Workshop. Um, so it'll be officially an off-Broadway production, and then it will start touring the country. Um, so the next production that I know of that I have dates for is the spring of 2024 at the New York Theater Workshop. And then hopefully um, it will be coming to an area um, near the people who are watching so that um, they can go see it too. Right. Um, another very interesting question uh, somebody asked, why would the owner of the album choose the USA as the receiver of the album? So the owner of the album was an American. Mm -hmm. He was an American counterintelligence officer who brought the album home with him kind of as war booty. And he was a very interesting person. Um, his wife had predeceased him and they had no children and they were both only children. And so there was no living family. Um, and he at one point showed this album to a friend of his from church. And the friend of his said, you know, you should contact, this is kind of interesting, you should contact a museum about this. And so that's when he typed up the letter um, that uh, ended up on my desk. And so, um, he chose us because we were, I mean, he lived in Virginia and <laughs> we, we were right there. And, um, I think he, I think he recognized that it would have a good home at the museum. 
Hey, we are actually at the end of our program. I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Becky. Thank you so much again for uh, sharing your tremendous expertise with us. Um, it's been very enlightening. Thank you, Alan. Um, I, I personally had questions about uh, the Holocaust in the theater, but um, we are at the end. So uh, thank you all for coming. I would like to uh, bring our next event to our to your attention. It will take place uh, on site at the UCSD library on November 16th, uh, as announced on the slide at the beginning, and it will be live streamed. We will host the internationally uh, renowned scholar, Professor Jeffrey Weidlinger, who will talk about his most recent book, the In the Midst of Civilized Europe, the Pogroms of 1918 to 1921 and the Onset of the Holocaust. I hope you will be able to join us. Uh, thank you, everybody, and good night.